of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Hey, brother. Hello. There you are. There I am. Yes, indeed. Hey, I got the notes, uh, you know, and I just read them, so I don't, <laughs> I'm never prepared for all that, but. Uh, no, that's yes. all right. Is this the first time you've called? I called about a minute ago. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Because so. uh, I was making some adjustments. and yeah. Anyway. Um, it's starting to get a bit cold there, is it? Oh, yes. I'm wearing long sleeves. Yeah. And uh, you're wearing uh, something more spring-like. We're coming up to the, We're getting a bit warmer now. Right. Short, short sleeves. That's great. <laughs> How was your Yom How was your Yom Teruah? Last night. Yeah. Well, uh, you're, you probably started yours before I did. But when sunset came... Uh, Adam and I <clears throat> were out on the uh, in the back of the house where uh, all we have are trees, but there's neighbors just on the other side of the trees, maybe uh, 50 feet or so, and a whole street of neighbors. So I'm sure that they heard us through the woods. They're, they're probably hearing these uh, these two horns, you know, and we were blowing them in very bizarre ways. <laughs> I, I think I have, I've I've got it here. We should do it today. Let me go get my shofar. Yeah. Uh, oh, all right. You can enjoy the scenery here. Yes. When the children of Israel went around the city of Jericho, they were all perfectly quiet, and there were many, many of them, and they just went around the city, and uh, once a day, I guess, until the seventh day, they went around seven times, but uh, they were actually. Uh, as, you know, when they blew the shofars and they started to yell, it kind of reminds me of Yom Teruah because they were, it's the day of the shout. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's shouting is is the shofar. But, of course, if you have to just shout, <laughs> if you don't have a shofar, why not? Yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. yeah, that's what it says. That if you read Leviticus 23 and you look up the actual word, you know, a, a day of the day of a day of blowing of shofars. It actually doesn't say that. It says a day of shouting. You know, really? but of course, the, uh, understanding is that the horns are shouting. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. You go first. Yours will sound proper because I've just got this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Torah Talk, brothers and sisters. We're in our ninth episode now, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here. And uh, we'd like to uh, welcome Yehusha to this conversation. We uh, we have a few things jotted down, but we just want to flow with him most of all and say what he'd like us to say. So we love you, Yehusha, and we pray that you'll be here. So be it. Oh. Uh, would you all uh, like to hear a, a bit of Psalm 8? Yes. Psalm 8 is so amazing. It says, O oh, Yahuwah, our Master, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who set your splendor above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have found strength, or founded strength, because of your adversaries, to put an end to enemy and avenger. I see your heavens the work of your fingers, 
the moon and the stars which you have established. What is man that you should remember him, and the son of man that you should visit him? Isn't that amazing? That's just the beginning of the song. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, uh, we blew this last week too, and uh, yeah. you know, and I and I mentioned that I had a couple of holes I put in mine that I can actually get different tones out of. Uh, you know, yeah, the two holes here. I heard dogs yeah. barking last week while you were playing that. I heard that. Yeah, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, it was the day of shouting. Yeah, that's uh, it. They were anyway. The recorder is similar to the the holes there. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, really. So anyway, let's see, what was the... Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, on the... Uh, it didn't occur to me until I started putting the newsletter together and just started trying to line things up and do what you do. And I wondered why uh, why everybody on the menorah, when they line up the, the feast on the seven feasts of the seven menorahs, they have one for Passover and one for unleavened bread when one of those isn't a Sabbath, and yet they leave out the last one, um, mm. Simcot, Simcot Torah. Why, why is well, that? There's just so much fun, we just can't cram it all in. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, here's, here's the way I see it. Passover and unleavened bread are referred to by one word, usually Passover yeah. or Matzah. But it, when they came, the children came out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, there was a, there wasn't really a rest day. They were actually leaving, but we remember that day they left by the fifteenth of Abib or the first month, and that day we rest as a remembrance of it. We it's not really called a a Sabbath, but it's called a, a day of rest. You know, which we understand to be basically the same thing. But it's a a day that we can cook and. We can travel a little bit, you know. Uh, we shouldn't be buying and selling, of course. We should abstain from, you know, commerce. But uh, I would probably want to keep my children home from school, you know, even though they're not working. It's it's a day that we're supposed to be together. And the seventh day from that point, in Matzah, the seventh day of Matzah, is the day that the children of Israel, as it's understood, were uh, hemmed in by the sea. And that would be some place of within a week's distance of, uh, on foot. So when the uh, the armies of Mitzrayim or Egypt were attacking them, it says all the chariots of the empire were attacking them, and they went through the water, the Egyptians followed them, and so the seventh day is also a day we take off in Matzah, and we would be remembering that Yahuwah delivered the children of Israel from a certain death, and a lot of them would have had to have been taken back to the land of Egypt again, or Mitzrayim. And so, uh, you know, he slew all the mighty ones uh, of the Egyptians. You know, so Egypt never recovered from the plagues and the destruction of their the most powerful army on the earth. So you, you, you see, there are two rest days right there. But if we if we put them all in into the picture of the menorah, mm -hmm. then it's going to be well. We could, and you did real well uh, on your design. I like to try to keep Shabbat usually in the middle because it's like really the giving of the Torah. But then you you shifted yours, and I like the way you did it too, uh, where it went beyond that. So, but if you have seven annual festivals, or Mo Moedim is a better term, because they're not all festivals, because Yom Kafar would not be a festival, it would be a, an appointed time, a Moed. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Semkat Torah, though, being in there is, is wonderful, hmm. uh, although it's outside the actual Feast of Tabernacles, it's the eighth day. I it's just, the closed, uh, closing festival. I just wondered why they had the, they'd have the first day of Passover, and then the second day of well, they'd have Passover, and then they'd have the unleavened bread, and then they'd have first fruits as well. But first fruits, yeah. first fruits is the seventh day of Passover. Well, actually, first fruits can be any pretty much any time in from the sixteenth all the way through the, the seventh day of the festival, because it, it's a matter of when the moon. Uh, well, it's really a matter of uh, well, first fruits is about the resurrection, mm. and with our understanding, we see that 
the older brother Yehuda doesn't have the sign of Yona, which is three days and three nights. So they always keep their observance on the morrow after the first high Sabbath or first annual Sabbath or rest day. And they understand that the 16th of Abib is the day that they start counting their week, which is not a week. It's actually just a group of seven days. And, but that's actually not a, a, a proper understanding of the words. Um, <clears throat> we have to actually have real weeks. And so in the midst of the festival of matzah, there is a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath. And from the morrow after that day, the day after that weekly Sabbath, that represents the, the resurrection, first fruits, because Yahusha is the first fruits, mm. many brothers and sisters. So uh, starting from that point, you count for yourself seven complete, intact weeks, weeks. And the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, which will be the first day of the week, is Shavuot. And Shavuot means weeks. It's a plural. So that misunderstanding is being inherited by a lot of Sarit. You know, they're, they are failing to uh, comprehend that Yahusha had shown them by his resurrection that there were three days and three nights from the time he was executed and put in the tomb. Uh, now, it isn't that way every single uh, year. Now, it was that, that way that year, you know, okay. because of days of the week. So the days of the week lined up that way because it would have been uh, at the beginning of the fourth day of the week that he would have been keeping the, you know, the Passover. Yeah. And then the following day, he was executed and then put in the tomb that day. And then three days and three nights later, he resurrected, which would have been the first day of the week. Yeah. So the Christians actually have that much almost correct except the, the fact that he was resurrected at the at sunset on the mm. Sabbath of that week yeah. rather than morning because see the morning had to do with Ezekiel chapter 8 when they went uh, facing the sun and they were worshiping the sun the sunrise services those sunrise services are not about Messiah it's about mm. Tom mm. you know yeah I get it how come we're allowed to say his name, but we're not allowed to say the... Was, is it because he was a real person, or is... Yeah, he's a real person. Oh, yeah. so we can say the names of real people, but not... Die not family people, yeah. Oh, he, yeah. Was, he was uh, deified, but, you know, when they're real people, I mean, they worshipped, uh, you know, a lot of people. I mean, they worshipped real men. Uh, you know, the kings of the earth were all worshipped as deities. You know, the Caesars and so forth. Hmm. Anyway, I wanted to say that I've got a visitor here. I've got a visitor here. Now, this is the camera right here, see? Yeah. This is Phyllis, my wife. Oh, I can't see if I'm in here or not. Can you, can you see? Half your face. Come down, down, down. Yeah, come okay. on down. Okay, well, what if I sit in my husband's lap? Okay. okay. Does that there work? There we go. Wonderful. Hello. So this is Phyllis. There you go. Did you, you, you didn't like blow the chauffeur? Well, she we, heard it. Yeah. Heard, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can hear it outside, too, when he blows it. Mm -hmm. he, and, uh, he and Adam were blowing the chauffeur last night out on the deck, and we were wondering if it was the neighbors were hearing this mm -hmm. wake-up call. Oh, yes. Fantastic. They were terrified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> terrified. Yeah. We terrified the neighborhood. Yeah. I just wanted to say hello. That's a lovely sister. How you going? Shalom. You been good? Okay. Shalom. Yeah, shalom. Okay. I, uh, well, that was enough. Yeah, it was lovely. So if you've got younger believers, we've been talking to a few people, younger believers who still live, live with their parents, their parents are unbelieving, and they're putting a bit of pressure on them, um, you shouldn't go just doing this in their face, should you? You should try and be, because you're living in your parents' home. What would you advise young people who are sort of getting a bit of pressure from their parents to, you know, don't you blow that thing in my house? <laughs> well, don't blow it in the house. Take yeah. it somewhere where they won't be bothered by it. Yeah. I would respect other people, especially my parents. Mm. Uh, and, I, and when my parents open up a discussion with me, I just tell them the truth and I give them just a little bit. And if they want to pull more out, 
I will. But when we start lecturing or condemning or anything like that, then we're not, we don't have the spirit of Yahushua in charge. It's our zeal that's pushing everything. And we, we want to be careful uh, with parents and relatives, friends, and just, you know, be respectful. They're involved in a lot of paganism and witchcraft and, you know, the, all the things that the world has, you know, infected them with and has dirtied our hearts up with too. But we have to understand that it is a, uh, it's a process that we have to go through. And first, we have to receive the spirit of Yahushua in our hearts, and he will clean it up. But <clears throat> we can't go sweeping in someone else's heart and say, well, you know, if you just do this and do this and do this and give them all the directions, but they don't have his spirit, mm. then it's mm. not going to help. You know, you, you, you see, this is a process, and Yahushua is doing all the work. He's cleaning our hearts out yeah. and has swept out a lot of, out, out of all of our hearts, and he's continuing. It's a process. We're all our lives. We're going to be going through that. But now, as far as being respectful of, if I were living in my parents' in a house and I was say nineteen or or twenty five years old, you know, or whatever, whatever age it is, their their children are staying with their parents longer these days because of the economy. But um, I would uh, respect them and not do anything that was offensive to them because that's not the way to make them convinced that you're right. Mm. Truth is something that they will pull out of you if they want truth. If they're not thirsty, though, you can't force feed them. Yes. You know. Mm. That's brilliant. Uh, I, I often remember the time that I was explaining a couple of things to my dad, and in the early days, I probably gave him more than I should have, but he would always take the side of the Catholics and say, well, the Catholics are Israel. You know, that's the replacement theology. Yeah. And of course, Protestants inherited that idea that Christianity is Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all the, the truth. Yeah. But they don't know about how things really developed. But he said, uh, well, Lou, are you saying that I'm a pagan? And I said, Dad, I didn't mean to make you feel that way. But, you know, when you're, when you're doing things that are from another place, you know, then you have to acknowledge, you know, but you don't have to be doing the things that you do. You know, a lot of the things in my study on witchcraft for the next seminar that's coming up this weekend, by the way, uh, I basically want to make the, the main point is that when you're watching magic being performed by a magician, first of all, you shouldn't be there. <laughs> but if you are watching it, their skill is based upon their ability to misdirect your attention so that when, when they're operating they're the real thing that they're doing, the deception is really in getting your attention off of what they're really doing towards something else. And in witchcraft, we have this thing that has all of these images and activities that we see that we identify as witchcraft, you know, the things that we know that are witchcraft. But the real activity, the real magic that's being done is by misdirecting our attention to that when in fact it is religion. Mm. That's the real trick. Yeah. And that's the misdirection. Because the thing that we look at when we go into one of these steeples is the very same thing that we see on the head of a witch. It's this pointed structure. And that's just one example. But the real operation is misdirection. Mm. And I, I think that, you know, that's one of the things that people miss. And that's the the main thing that is being is being so successful all over the planet. Mm. Is misdirection misdirection and we're we're practicing witchcraft or they the people are practicing witchcraft thinking that they're actually worshiping the true creator. Mm. Wow. You know, Sunday, the bunny rabbit thing, the Christmas tree, uh, all of the things that they do mm. is actually mm -hmm. witchcraft because they've been, they see the real, the other witchcraft 
and they think, well, this can't be that. No. You know, but it's but that's the real trick. Yeah, sneaky. I don't know. I don't know if I'm really saying it well enough, but uh, no, I, no, I get it. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, it's no effort. Anyway. It's no effort for Satan to get people who are already acknowledging that they worship Satan, is it? It's it's a challenge for him to, to trick people into th who think they're good, lovely, circus-going people, and they're actually worshiping him as well mm -hmm. through witchcraft. Yes. Mm. So we're on the uh, day of uh, Yom Teruah today. I wanted to ask you, um, from last week we were talking about and we were lining up what Yahushua is doing on each day. Uh, I know you don't like charts, <laughs> but uh, um, I wanted to ask, if Yahushua returns on the day of trumpets, on this day, but uh, and that's when the dead in Yahushua, in Messiah, are raised up, and... The uh, the next feast, which is ten days away, I think Yom Kafar, is when the living, who make it, are transformed. What's Yahushua doing for that? What what are we what are we doing? And what's Yahushua doing? We're just hovering around for wait for ten days, watching this thing happen while the dead rise. Don't we all raise together? The dead and the alive. Well, I, uh, I I keep all of these things in my heart in in a in a as a teacher knowing that we really don't know no. exactly if it'll be minutes or hours if if Yom Teruah comes and there's a shofar a shout of an archangel that blasts out and the dead are raised on a Yom Teruah possibly this one or maybe next one or at some point some people say uh, in 2028 20, or 2025 20, but we don't know exactly what year it is but when it happens, then the following thing that happens, we just have to know what that next process is. Then the living are transformed and clothed with immortality, and they don't actually have to suffer the first death because they're changed in the twinkling of an eye, as it says. Uh, now, that could be also, as uh, I've mentioned before, on Yom Kafar, which is the tenth day, so we have 10 days, and what what are we doing? Well, I don't know. If it goes that far, the covering, the day of the covering, or the day of atonement, would be uh, applicable to someone who was being changed in the toy week of an eye, too. But I'm just saying it makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly that way. I'm not going to put anything in concrete and say it, it's definitely this. Because, you see, that's all in Yahushua's department. That's all his operation. As long as we can be equipped well enough to be expecting something that is in a process that that he's in charge of. But when we start setting ourselves into um, a grid and we say, well, that's not the thing because I didn't schedule it there, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's uh, it's and, and if he wants to come back at a different time of the year, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to say, well, I know the festivals are set up this way. However, I lean very heavily on the fact that he's always operated on schedule. Mm. Every single mm. festival that he was involved in, and, he's, and he established the festivals for the purpose of the redemption of Israel. And every single thing that he's done has happened right on schedule. Yeah. As the moon and the sun and the seasons are all in place, so it happens right in time, and uh, I expect that it would be Yom Teruah that, you know, Thessalonians is talking about in the twinkling of an eye, and the, the archangel is going to raise, is going to blast, and the dead will be raised. Uh, the dead will be raised first, though. That's the thing that we have to understand. Now, why would that be? Well, I don't know. It just says that. Now, that's because... Paul enlightened the, the knowledge for us. And he was given instructions from Yahushua directly, we know. So those that, uh, that understand what Paul is saying, I don't know that we can find uh, any other record in the scriptures that indicates it as clearly as he placed it there. But uh, that's, you know, the way, the, the way it is. Uh, now, I, like I say, I don't want to put this thing in stone and, and, and sit, 
pour the concrete and say, these are the fixed points. And uh, of course, some of the knots are even setting dates. They're saying, well, we've had this yeah. many years, so it's the time's up. It's coming right up. You know? uh, there, was one on, there was one on the internet, uh, on the YouTube a couple of days ago, saying something about you know, the 11th of the 11th. That's this year. <laughs> that's a oh, fact. really? That's so it's going to be uh, it's going to be November the eleventh. Yeah, uh, no, November two thousand and eleven. Well, there was a date there somewhere. I thought well, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, we we definitely hope. But <laughs> I would uh, think that uh, that's something that Yahusha himself said. It is not for us to know. No. And if it's not for us to know, but he will. He did say that we would you know be we we would know the the general time it would occur. Season. He didn't say. We would know the day, though, you know, yeah. it, or the year, but we would know the time. In other words, the season that, that it's going to occur in, and that's what we're saying because of the fact that the seventh moon and the festivals that are contained with it are unfulfilled redemption shadows. You know, the other thing is why are the um, Yahudim or uh, Anal Ozma saying uh, uh, Rosh Hanash or whatever it is, Happy New Year and stuff like that, and Amy asked me about it. I said, "Well, that can't, isn't the first. They came out of Egypt, and that was their first. That would have been the beginning, wasn't it? That was the beginning of the year for them." Oh, Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Rosh or Rosh ra, means head, yeah. and it means first. And Hashanah. Well, Shana means year, so we put Hashanah on it, meaning the year. So the head of the year is what. Tradition, and I'm emphasizing the word tradition, has been among the Yahudim to call the first day of the seventh moon, which is today. We call it Teruah because that's what the scriptures call it. See, the scripture calls this Yom Teruah, the day of the shout. And um, But Rosh Hashanah is what they've been calling it. And... There was a, an Orthodox rabbi who wrote a book, got two books actually. One was called The Jewish Book of Why, and the second Jewish Book of Why. He wrote those two books. His name was Alfred Kolach, and he calls himself a rabbi. Anyway, he had all the answers to all these strange questions. So when the uh, Jews or the Yahudim would ask him a question, then he would give them an answer in, the, in these books. And one of the questions was, why is it that we call the first day of the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, when the first month is in the early springtime. And he said, it's just tradition. And he said that it's actually not correct. <laughs> so, okay. Who cares? Uh, it's tradition. But you're, it is because they came out of uh, another place and they had picked up this habit. And they very easily pick up these habits. Yeah. As do we all. I mean, we're very likely to pick up on the oddest thing. Uh, I mean, here we are running around with Christmas trees and, and uh, pumpkins and Halloween, uh, and it's all about the children. And, you know, it's, it's something that we, we, we tell lies to children, and then, we are, and then they grow up and become young adults, and then they teach their children these lies. And, you know, I, I like that email of that picture the next time that you know, your child, what was it the child was saying? Uh, the next time your mum and dad accuse you of lying, just look them right in the eye and say, Santa Claus, bunny rabbits, tooth fairy, something like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, speaking of that, I had a gentleman walk up to me yesterday, and he wanted to propose putting a little fairy door outside my business, you know, uh, it, because it's becoming popular, and it has a little stamp-sized uh, code on it that people can scan with their cell phones and go to the internet and see the picture of the fairy that lives inside this door. <laughs> and I'm going, boing. Oh, boy. How do you explain this to him? And he's trying to sell businesses these little fairy doors with these little symbols on them so that people could come up and scan to see the picture. And uh, I'm thinking... Uh, Wow, how far how far away that, that the world really is, uh, that we're entertaining ourselves. And this is really geared towards children. Mm. Because adults are not likely to go, 
hey, there's a little ferry door down there. It's a foot off the ground. Yeah. You know, who's yeah. that for? You know, it's not <laughs> for adults. Yeah. It's down here. And he's showing me uh, one across the street. He says, see that little thing? Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking, man, it's all about, you know, deceiving children. Yeah. And now these new things are starting to pick up, you know. And he says, well, for the older ones, we have gnome doors. Oh. And I'm, oh, oh, good. <laughs> are we going to have trolls? Yeah. yeah, we're going to have trolls, too. You know? Trolls. Uh, just yeah. go to the Internet and see the picture of the troll or the gnome that lives behind this door. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, just incredible. We do with trolls most of the day anyway on the Internet. <laughs> we, yeah, Internet trolls. Yeah. yeah. Reputation. Yeah. People that destroy yeah. your reputation. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're destroying lots of people all over. I mean, there's tons of that activity going on on the internet. Yeah. You know, there's even businesses that are starting up to um, help your reputation from being damaged by trolls. You wow. know? Well, I I think the best insurance is to just keep doing Yahusha's work, hmm. and he will take care of everything. You know, yeah. you don't need a business to come and clean up your reputation. You know. No. <laughs> Um, I know that uh, I've got a scripture here. Where is it? One Corinthians two says, "Eye has not seen, and he, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man what Elohim has prepared for those who love Him." So I know we can't even imagine how wonderful it's going to be. But do you? Do you often imagine what it might be, what? given your oh. in, intense knowledge of Torah? Have you thought about oh. what we might look like, or? Uh, will we still look, what age will we look? Will we look like we look at some age or how, have you ever pondered those sort of things? Of course, yes. Uh, everyone has, I think, and yeah. to some extent, because, you know, these questions are all things that we all have. How old are we going to look? You know, of course, immortality, it wouldn't really matter what you really look like. I mean, you know, I wonder if Yona, the one that got, uh, all the digestive fluids all over him is going to look all mottled, and whether it's if he's going to be wearing clothes that are all half eaten, I don't think so. I think that we're all going to be very, very uh, amazed at one another, and we'll identify with each other. And I can't wait to meet Yahusha. He's the most important. Uh, I mean, of course. I mean, Yahusha. He's the one we're going to have our eyes on. We can have famous people all around us, but hello. You know, we're going to be really into him. you got to keep your eyes on him. But, yeah. but uh, what he's prepared for us is just, um, it's going to be unbelievable. And it's, and it's going to be uh, wonderful. We're, we're not going to be floating around on clouds. We're going to be on the earth, and the earth is going to be renewed, and everything is going to be uh, perfect again. And uh, I just, and the animals are going to, that we're going to have, we're going to have, uh, companions that he created. He created the animals to be companions, you know, for us. You know, I mean, we can love animals, and, and and many people do. I love animals. You know, I've lost many a pet and shed tears over them. You know, mm -hmm. they were uh, very precious to me. They're like children. You know, yeah. not as important, of course, but yeah. you know, they are like, you know, companions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, return love to you, and, and, and they show their concern. I have uh, two cats and one dog right now, and two of those animals are getting really, really old. And, uh, you know, so, but I, uh, I wonder sometimes if, if they're, uh, if, you know, I have wondered if they're going to be resurrected, uh, pets that I've loved. Mm -hmm. But I don't expect that. I don't. I really don't. Some people do, but I don't expect that we'll see our old pet friends again. Do animals have a spirit being in them, or a soul? Some people might say. Well, they have a nephesh. They have the life force that was breathed. Uh, apparently, he breathed uh, life into them, but it wasn't the same thing that, as what happened with the first man and woman. But. Um, these are all things that, you know, he's done. That's the most incredible thing about when you study biology and you can get all the things correct and you can put all the pieces together that are necessary for life, but it will not be alive mm -hmm. until you breathe life into it and brings it to life. So there's another complete, infinitely higher dimension 
of uh, enormity that we'd have to concede to the fact that, and you know, one person, a scientist, was saying that the, the way the DNA helix is running, the way it, it's, it, it turns in a certain direction, if it turned in the other direction, it would not be possible for it to be alive. It couldn't do what it does. So actually, everything about life is by design, you know. But then there's still that higher level, like you were saying, there's a, there's a spirit that is keeping in sync with it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, you know, the difference between ma uh, mankind and, and the animal kingdom is vast. Even though scientists will say, well, we have 93% uh, the same DNA as that thing over there, uh, you know. Well, and then again, the superiority of, of uh, one thing over another doesn't have to do with how many, uh, how, how complex it is either. Because there's, there's uh, farms are about the most complex uh, living thing. Ferns. You know, farms. Ferns. Yeah, you know, plants. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have 243 or, it's over, I forget the number, but it's over 200 chromosomes. Wow. We've got 46 chromosomes. Huh. They must be thinking that when, the, when, you, when you walk by a fern, the ferns are, are probably looking over and going, what a moron. <laughs> Don't no, I'm only yeah. Yeah, don't <laughs> They're liable to attack. Uh, actually, <laughs> anyway, yeah. I don't know how many people uh, think about that, but chromosomes are not the thing that matters. Um, well, it, it does matter, of course, by design, but, you know, uh, yet, we don't know how things are going to be. And yet they still won't give, they still won't acknowledge that there's a higher power there that breathes life. It just came from slime. And lightning hit it and uh, changed it. And uh, <laughs> Well, that's uh, just amazing. Well, a lot of that stuff comes from uh, Zoroastrianism and ancient religions where uh, they worship the skies and the elements. And, you know, that's not possible. But, uh, you know, because you have to have life in order to, sustain life. You can't just have life spontaneously popping up. I mean, Louis Pasteur was a, one of the early scientists that experimented with, you know, putting the right ingredients together and then standing back and waiting for something to happen. But, uh, you know, that, that wasn't possible. And the only thing that happened was uh, that came out of things because people were seeing life flying out of dead matter. And they were saying, well, this is uh, obviously spontaneous life. And it was really just flies laying eggs, you know, oh. maggots, mm. you know. So talking about the uh, nefesh, um, like we've got a nefesh and we've got uh, a physical body. When Yahushua was transformed, um, does that mean he was, well, he, he was obviously both, wasn't he? Because they could touch his, his wounds. And yet he could still walk through walls and disappear. Does that mean our new bodies will will be uh, will they be physical and spiritual as well? We'll, we'll be eating, we'll be pooing, <laughs> what will we be doing? <laughs> well, we, we assume that uh, we'll be restored to the original state that Adam and Kala uh, were before the fall, uh, and that would be the the objective is because we would be you know able to do those things. I mean, obviously, the likelihood is that they were able to do that. They were born, or not born, they were created in a form that was different than we are, because mm. obviously death entered the world at that point, and it isn't like there were a lot of dead bones under their feet or anything like that. There was no dead animals or anything. Plants would not die, they would wither. See, the plants weren't really dying, and plants don't die now. They just wither. It's a matter of, uh, it isn't exactly death, because they don't have nefesh. Plants don't have nefesh. Uh, but the animals do. So uh, they would eat, an eat plants. They weren't eating animals. But they would eat plants, and then their bodies would 
Yeah, and I, I guess that's probably what we're going to be experiencing, is we'll be eating plants once again, and uh, I hope that we won't be eating animals. I don't yeah. think, I don't expect that we will. But then Yahushua was eating fish, mm. you know, and um, it's just something we don't really know. These, these are things that we can speculate about, but, you know, it's going to be different, a lot different. Mm. And the immortality is going to be the, the, the main thing that we're going to be experiencing. And we won't be able to be harmed by hot or cold, heat or cold, or uh, anything that can happen to our bodies, it won't, it won't matter because we're going to be different, you know. And like you say, Yahushua walked through, obviously, his spirit inter it just appeared in the room with the disciples, the, the, the apostles, and the believers. So the doors were locked, and there he is just making his appearance. And um, I expect that uh, even before his resurrection, he was able to do those things because he just disappeared from sight when they were trying to apprehend him. Mm. For this, yeah, when trying to take him and throw him over the brow of the cliff, you know, in his hometown, and they were trying to apprehend him to throw him over, and he just sort of, where is he? You know, he just. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I expect that, 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 that of course, his. All the fullness of deity dwells in him. Mm. Bible. And the, what was it called? The transfiguration, was it? When he appeared on the mountain with, with, That's uh, Eli who was it again? Moshe and Elijah, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. And he was, he was standing with these two men. And that's, I've speculated that that would be a, a time portal call that he was, he was actually talking to these two men and he had folded time and opened it up like we're, you know, talking on Skype mm. in a certain way. We can see each other, although we're nowhere near each other, yeah. but we are mm. in the same time. But uh, Yahushua has the capability to fold time, too. Mm. <clears throat> so Moshe, at some point, who did not live during Eli Eliyahu's lifespan, was probably seeing Eliyahu, Eliyahu seeing Moshe. And, of course, <laughs> you know, Eliyahu probably knew very well who Moshe was. Well, and stuff was going on up that mountain that we didn't know about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but raising them from the dead, I don't expect that is possible, that he was talking to their spirits, mm -hmm. but in, most likely he was just folding time and mm -hmm. talking to, you know, across time. Of course, that's even more hard for people to believe than him raising their spirits, and that shouldn't be because, yeah. you know, the witch it is. The witch at Endor, when Shaul went to her, because Yahuwah wasn't giving any answers, Yahuwah had removed his spirit and his blessings from Shaul. So he took two of his companions, and Shaul went to go see this witch. And the witch was going, whoa, you want me to call up who? And <laughs> she witch. probably knew. Anyway, Which she thought. Are we talking about? Oh, the witch, the witch at Endor. Which Shaul are we talking about? We're talking about the first king of Israel. Oh, yes. Yeah, he went to go consult a witch, and of course he'd been, a, you know, persecuting and, and killing people that were sorceresses and sorcerers, and uh, she thought that it was a trap, you know, because, but he said, no, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to you, I really want to know, I want to see Samuel or Shemuel, and uh, when Shemuel appeared, she's freaking out, because she's... <laughs> She's thinking, what? You know, even though she's a sorceress. Uh, so, you know, when the dead are being contacted, that's an abomination, you know. But mm -hmm. apparently this really was Shaul. Although in every other case, it's going to be some demon that's mm -hmm. pretending. But that would be, uh, I mean, you know, all these things are outside our realm of experience. Yeah. And all we can do is just, is just guess. Yeah. You know, and and I'm going to be the first to admit that. Mm. Why do you think uh, Yahushua appeared on the mountain with those two blokes? What was the purpose of that? Was he just showing off to his disciples? Or, I, I know that's not the reason, but what uh, I forget what the purpose of that was. Well, the purpose was 
it was during the time, as we understand it, it was time that during the time of Sukoth, and uh, as you know, uh, Kepha and Yaakov and Yahukadin, those three, were there. Uh, they were considered the supports, the pillars hmm. of first, uh, the first assembly, and uh, he he took his three closest disciples, students, up to this place, and that's why Kepha, when he saw this, he was frightened out of his wits, but he said, it's wonderful that we're here, why don't you allow us to build three booths? You know, he's talking about sukkah, sukkahs, mm. you know, one for you, and one for Moshe, and one for Eliyahu, wow. and, you know, and, uh, but anyway, the real purpose for the transfiguration, as they call it, would uh, be anybody's guess, really. I mean, we could speculate, but uh, it would be most probably because these three people needed to see who they're dealing with. You know, he wanted to show them a closer look at the inner workings of who he is, who Yahusha is, and he is the creator. He is the one that's in charge. He's the one that made the covenants, you know, with motion, you know. And, of course, the purpose of them being those two men, the, the two men were very critical because, you know, they're like two witnesses. Moshe gave the Torah, or was given the Torah, and was to disseminate that to the children of Israel. And then as a priesthood, they were to disseminate that into the nations, which is what our job is. And Eliyahu, his mission was to proclaim that, you, that Yahuwah is Elohim and that you should only worship him. And that was the message during the time of the northern tribes being in rebellion under Ahab and his wife. How should we pronounce her name? Is it a B-E-L? Yeah. We can't, oh, we can't say that word, can we? Her name is, uh, it means virgin of B-A-A-L. Ah. Is is a B E E L or B E L, you know. Ah. So don't say J J E Z. How do you spell that? J E Z. J E Z or J E Z. Yeah. It's e the way they say Z in <laughs> Australia. Yeah. 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 It's cool. E B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. B E L. Yeah. So it's not just a pagan deity. It's if their name means a pagan deity as well. It does, yes. She was the daughter of uh, a Sidonian king. And the Sidonians were worshippers of B-A-A-L and A-S-H-E-R-A-H. So, you know, that uh, that was bad. And that was the reason that the northern tribes were affected. And that's why we have Christmas trees and all those things. You know, all the ornaments. And, because we're looking at uh, that religion that uh, she inflicted upon the northern tribes and then the northern tribes carried that into the nations hmm. might be a silly question but why do you think Yahusha created the world uh, I mean for those of us who look at all these uh, you know futuristic movies and you know you see things shining and sparkling and well it says that in Revelation you know the, the sea of glass and things like that but um, why do you think he created the earth very earthy you know, dirt and trees and, you know, it's, do you think that's what the new one will be like? So you don't, it doesn't look polished or shiny or, <laughs> you know, we, sometimes we think of chrome and, you know, things like that or, you know, yeah. that's just, you know, what you think about when you think about future cities and things, but that's what yeah. the Skyfire movies have filled us with. But why do you think he um, made it so, uh, uh, you know, sand, <laughs> you know? Dirt, leaves. Yeah, and all the metals and things that are in the caves and rocks, and mm. uh, it's just a a lot of it's just a, an amazing thing. I don't know. It's really complex, and I don't know why or or how he managed it, but you know that's his department. And when we start <laughs> analyzing it and going, well, I don't really like that. You know, yeah. we might want to be careful about what we say. Yeah, because yeah. every word is important, yeah. but. Uh, we are to say, 
uh, what's this you're managing to do over here? What is this you're, he's the potter. You don't yeah. say, well, what's your plan, potter? You know, yeah. all we have to do is just say, well, this is an amazing creation. Yeah. You know, and I and just like it. <laughs> be in awe of it, you know, yeah, like yeah. reading Psalm 8, yeah. just a few minutes ago. And uh, it's saying how wonderful this creation really is. Yeah. Uh, we, we may not like dirt, but look at the amazing things that come out of dirt. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. plants and and the soil and the, the rock gives us a foundation because the Earth's crust is mostly, you know, the rock. Yeah. It's cooled magma or, you know, lava. But uh, it's just amazing, you know. Do you believe um, that before Noah, the Earth had a water canopy around it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? And the water below, too, somehow. And the water was coming from above and below, and it was just overwhelming the entire Earth. I, I'm one of those, you know, young Earthers, and I believe that the water covered the entire surface of the Earth, not just a, a little valley somewhere, you know. So it'd be like because, a greenhouse, like, like a... Like that, yeah, chemical. and it kept temperature of the earth everywhere, a uniform temperature, not only everywhere, but also day and night, there would have been a very uniform temperature. So Adam and Kawhi probably would not have had a word for weather, you know, because mm -hmm. there wouldn't have been any rain. The mists uh, came up from the earth and watered everything. Apparently it was pretty amazing because they probably didn't have to bathe themselves that much either because they were being exposed to all this mist. And they were completely drenched in the evening every day. So he wanted them to be, go to sleep and be clean. Yeah. Because if it was washing the plants and self cleaning, self cleaning overnight. What about that? Yeah. That's yeah. That's better and than it, future cities, mate. <laughs> and it was probably a perfect temperature, just yeah. like you get the the showers adjusted just right. Yeah. It was probably just right. Yeah, that's a great temperature. You know, it wouldn't be too hot or too cold. Yeah. You know. Of course, it wouldn't have mattered that much, too much, because, as I understand it, they would have not been able to be harmed by anything either. But, you know, uh, there wouldn't be any reason for them to be in, in fear for their lives, you know, no. at that point. No. Now, after the fall, then people started to die mm -hmm. because of injuries. And, you know, like when uh, Cain killed his brother, yeah. you know, a rock can be a problem, but, you know... Yeah. There's uh, in, in great, a great likelihood that they were immortal, you know, at that point. Yeah. So do you in think there were do you think there were beasts and dinosaurs and things on the earth at that time, or do you think they were? Um, Absolutely, yes. So they weren't nephilated things. They were. There were some pretty scary things, probably uh, that we would be afraid of now, but at that time they were all e eating plants. You know, those beasts and great beasts that they were, you know, they had enormous size and we call them dinosaurs, which means a terrible lizard. But uh, their bones are in the earth. And of course, Yahusha was done with them living there, you know, and all the species are actually dwindling. Every year, there's several hundred thousand species that are just disappearing. And that's a natural thing that's happening. It's not, and and, and I use that word, uh, you know, carefully because it's it's a, it's by design. The, you know, the, the uh, physical world is falling, and it's it's dissolving. I mean, the second law of thermodynamics is is basically defining chaos. Chaos is is overwhelming things, and species are are dying off, and so it's. Uh, but, you know, one of the scary things is <clears throat> with these genome projects and things that they're doing, which is rebellion, it's actually causing uh, these scientists to get interested in resurrecting some of these, not resurrecting, but to manipulate the, the, the DNA that's in these dinosaur eggs and other things like raptors. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have a bunch of raptor farms around, no. you know. And sneaking up on your children, those would hunt in packs, you know, like coyotes, and they were real fast yeah. and <clears throat> deadly. And I suspect that they may have been uh, genetically manipulated with before the flood too, because the uh, the messengers, the fallen messengers, were messing with genetics, you know, not just with women, 
but with, you know, causing gymnephilim and violent human alterations, what we would call transhumans. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but they were probably messing with the, uh, with the animals too, and this was causing these animals to become violent, and there was a lot of death and a lot of uh, mayhem. Mm -hmm. So Yehuda had decided to just destroy all flesh, mm -hmm. everything that had the breath of life in it, which would also say that everything that had the breath of life in it that was going to be destroyed, as he said, would also mean that the entire planet was flooded because he wouldn't have meant just a few hundred miles. If everything that had the breath of life in it was going to be destroyed and he had to preserve a few that were okay, that he would bring to the ark to preserve their, their genetic lines, then why would he have to do that if it was just for a few hundred miles? You know. So if they, um, you mentioned the cloning and the genetic tampering, they still... You still can't manage to produce a fish in a lab, though. So, what uh, what is the? I know what the big deal is, but what is the big deal about them? They can't do it. Doesn't matter what kind of DNA you've got, does it? You haven't got the nefesh. I know this. I know the evil Malachim is setting something up because then they will be the nefesh. I assume they will be the controlling force in it. But if they're not in it, like in a in a lizard, I mean, what use does a Malachim have in a lizard? You know, what, how are they doing it if you can't produce a nefesh? Well, as we understand scripture, it does describe the fallen Malachim, well, Yahushua described it, that they de desire to be in a house. Okay. And they want something wet to be inside of that's alive. So their idea of possession of creatures, they could be in animals, they can be in people, but they have to push aside the resident that's in there. You know, the, the strong man, as Yahushua called it. The strong man would have to be overcome. That's the person that lives in the house. And uh, it's an interesting subject, but uh, mm -hmm. I think that probably the creatures that would be created from this genetic cloning process that they would have for bringing back raptors and huge dinosaurs using uh, elephants and the wounds of other large animals to give birth to either uh, well some have to be egg layers obviously but uh, they would be uh, possessed by these fallen Malachim yeah. you know so there you go and yeah, it's just it, it's just off the scale it, you know, why would people do this yeah. well it's because we're uh, he said it would be just as it was in the days of Noah, you know, that the violence was going to be increased and, and, the, and the rebellion is just going to be unlimited, you know, and the uh, fall of Malachim are actually helping these scientists get to where they are in their, in their uh, because a lot of the things that we've learned come from these spatial beings that, you know, have taught us uh, some, I mean, obviously the, the ability to write, if you read uh, the book of Enoch, I believe it is, or one of the books of Enoch, uh, the, the messengers were involved in teaching us how to write. You know, Adam and Kawad, we don't hear anything about them writing anything down, but, you know, they were probably, uh, during their lifetimes, which were very long, they probably were being instructed in uh, how to form letters and, and, and preserve knowledge. I don't know this. I'm just speculating. I mean, it's all imaginary, imaginary. But uh, mm. the uh, Malachim have obviously been engaged in teaching uh, a lot of bad things to people, mm. making weapons and you know the use of cosmetics, which isn't evil in itself, but that's mentioned in the scriptures mm. or some of the scriptures that are not accepted. But, uh, <laughs> I'm glad to clarify that. All the women nearly threw something at you. <laughs> oh no, no, go for the go for the cosmetics. I mean, a lot of people are are going to get. Oh, that Lou White, he's all for makeup, and you shouldn't be doing that. But no, the inner beauty is what we should be shooting for. But that doesn't mean the outer beauty is a problem. It's um, because you know Yahusha is very interested in women looking beautiful, 
so men will be interested in them. And uh, that was going on in the in the wilderness when uh, Israel was having those problems. You know, some of the jewelry that was being uh, brought to the for the you know the construction of the temple and the or not the tabernacle area. Uh, some of the people were saying, "Wait a minute." Those things are mirrors, and those mirrors are evil because women look into those mirrors and making themselves beautiful with yeah. the makeup. Yeah. And Moshe or Yehua said, "No, no, let the women bring these mirrors. This is very special to me because of the fact that uh, I can't remember the exact scripture on that, but uh, I, I'll have to look that up. But they were even more precious to him than anything because he says, with these mirrors, women are allowing." themselves to become beautiful and thereby the number of Israelites are increasing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Now that's gonna, something I study for years. But, uh, yeah. I was gonna ask you um if it says in the scripture somewhere to not cut yourself or in uh I mean like tattoos and things like that. What was what was with some of the weird jewelry like uh was it Yitchak and uh Ribka? Didn't he give her a uh, a nose ring or something? Yes, I don't think there was a piercing involved in that though, because okay. you see, uh, back in if you go back and look at First um, uh, Kings, I believe it is, where Eliyahu is confronting uh, Ahab and his wife I I Isa B E L, and her uh, the big showdown happens at Mount Carmel. It's called a Bell. <laughs> Yes, J or or how about uh, well whatever. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, what was it? What was it? <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, they were. Uh, what was I saying? I forgot. Through my back, you, you you made me erase what I was talking thinking. about. Nothing. Anyway, the uh, the fact is he was up there and he was confronting these pagan priests, you know, of B A A L and A S H. I think we're four hundred and fifty. Priests of Baal that ate at her table, and 400, 400 priests of A S H E R A H. Anyway, these pagans were basically warlocks, witches, shamans, you know, and they were teaching Israel to do the wrong things, you know. But um, the nose rings, and we were talking about that, the tattoos. When they were doing their prayers to their deities that aren't there, uh, they were praying to Hashatan and his demons, but uh, they were cutting themselves, you know, when they were praying to their deities, letting their blood flow out on their bodies and on their clothing to get the attention of their demonic uh, deities. And uh, at the end of that, there was nothing happened, and Eliyahu said, oh, they must be on vacation or perhaps sleeping. sleeping. <laughs> so anyway, it, it, then the, every, at the end of all that effort, he said, now let's stand back, everybody. Let's rebuild this altar and let's get these stones up here and let's pour some water on it, you know, barrels of water and put the sacrifice up there. And then he just speaks a few words. The fire falls from the sky and lights, er, licks everything up, the dust, even the water. And uh, then everybody yells, that Yehuda is Elohim. Mm -hmm. And they kept saying it. And then they gathered all the prophets of these people, and Eliyahu himself personally slew them, you know, with a giant knife of some kind. Yeah. So that was a very busy day for him. <laughs> Imagine. So, uh, wow. yeah, and uh, but uh, cutting the body mutilating the body, tattooing the body. These are things, and making ball places on your body, were actually pagan practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, Weikra, or Leviticus chapter 19, I believe it is, says that we're not to do that to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't want us learning the ways of the, of the pagan. Uh, Deuteron <laughs> Deuteronomy 12. And, you does, know. That mean the, does that mean the girls aren't supposed to shave their legs? I don't think that that's either here or there. I, I don't think that shaving a part of your body is, if if, if you want to do that, it's okay. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't think that, he talked about making ball places on your head. Oh, I get it. <laughs> okay. yeah. 
Sorry. Yeah. You know, but um, if 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 uh, paganism is involved in anything, though, shaving legs, I don't think there was anything like that going on with pagan priests or priestesses. But um, if it had been, we would probably want uh, our girls to have hairy legs. <laughs> and I have seen those before in some countries. Uh, over in Europe, there's actually girls that never shave their legs. It's just not a custom. Yeah. You know? wow. Of course, uh, my wife doesn't shave her legs, but she's got hairless legs. Yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. a natural thing for her. Oh, you're in trouble now. Telling the world that. <laughs> oh, well, shouldn't have ever said that. Oh, boy. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's neither good or bad. It's just. No, it's fine. great. Yeah. Yeah. But um, before we uh, go, I wanted to ask you one other thing um, about uh, running a seminar. At what point did you um, decide that it's time to run a seminar and advertise one? Uh, did you wait until there were. A group of believers around you, or did you just decide that now's the time? Put an ad in the paper, or whatever you did, and wait. I, you know, I don't really recall exactly how that started, but I wanted to do something to help the people locally and the people that were here in the in the Louisville area, where uh, basically wanting to learn, and there was just a few. A handful, really, and so we just decided to get together, and we sat around a table, and and uh, then I started to develop a, a little plan on what we might want to study, and of course that led to a more exploratory work for me, and I love that being able to look deeper into what's going on, and what Yahuwah's will for us really is, so we can have a a place that we could go and and kind of study for an hour or so. And uh, we decided that once a month was the best. It gave me time with my busy schedule, working in two places, basically. And then, so I was able to have the time to develop something. And then, I, sometimes I'd have to wait for him to tell me what it was going to be. But um, anyway, we would prepare something and uh, we'd have discussions and, uh, oh, you know, the it was always a, an open forum if anybody had a, a even an unrelated topic that they wanted to bring up. You know, that was uh, very important. It kind of reminded us of the way it really was in the scripture. So when we read about the, the times that they were getting together, we see that there's instructions about how to organize that, about how to make allowances for people who want to speak. And, uh, if they speak in another language, even, there needs to be an interpreter, you know, so that there's uh, not anybody that's going to think they're barbarians, you know. You, you don't want to look like barbarians to one another. But back in those days, there were people who were interested in the truth. There were Gentiles that would come into these uh, houses of study that couldn't understand some of the words. That's why we have the little seminar chart. At the very beginning of our seminar, we have the topics... Uh, the topic, of course, but we have the uh, the, the words, yeah. the the authentic words that Yahuwah breathed, and then we have uh, the Greek word or the customary traditional word, so that we can actually not be barbarians to them. Hmm. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. So when did you um, decide? Why did you decide to go to the bank building? Well, the bank building was an offer that was made to us. Uh, uh, a lovely sister. Um, basically was saying, her name is Janet, she worked at the bank, and having uh, a position at the bank, she had an, uh, an opportunity to use that facility. It was up on the, um, I forget what floor it was, but it was up there, high up in the building, and this facility was there with this beautiful room, and it had a projector with this big screen, and it was bright, and it had a little place for me to be with my materials, and the room was equipped with chairs. So they actually, the bank uses it for instructions and teaching themselves. So on uh, the first day of every uh, Roman month, we would, or the first first day of every Roman month, we 
made an arrangement to secure that facility because they were closed anyway. So we allowed, uh, she allowed us to get in there and we, uh, we would have a room full of people, you know. Mm -hmm. And now we're using our facility over at uh, Waterson Trail, you know, the uh, Torah Institute building where we are located. And that uh, is a facility that holds a nice room full of people too. Why and, did you decide to switch? Well, that's a question. Is but I think, if I recall, it was some time ago when Janet became somewhat ill, and she had to take time off from work. And subsequently, I think she's gone back. But uh, she, uh, Yahuwah healed her. You know, she had a serious illness, and for quite a bit of time, I mean, many months, and uh, now she's much, much better, you know. So, but we continue to use where we're at, and uh, down in uh, Australia, uh, a precious brother and sister uh, bought us a brand new projector. Yeah. And uh, we picked up a screen uh, at half price because it was slightly damaged. It won't close up. So, because it wouldn't close up, but it's really big, and it has a nice reflective surface. And we positioned that, and uh, two or three of us got up there and started and mounted the projector. And and now the projector is working really well for the last several months. Or really, sorry, it's been I guess six months now yeah. that we used, and uh, we've been using that, and it's really been effective. Yeah. So the whole group can see it, you know. Yeah. Well, see, they've got. Uh about a dozen people up north now in Cairns, and they have a meeting, and uh, there's believers in there. But uh, so we were sort of talking about it and saying, well, would I run a meeting down here? And I thought, well, is it the time to, if there's no one interested here, uh, do you just sort of, what do you do? Do you put feelers out, or do you do you wait until there's a couple of people sniffing around that want to get immersed, and because there, you know, there isn't any yet. Well, you should start, always start small, and and if you would get together at least once a month, you know, then if you made a schedule and you put out some information, you know, bulletin boards, uh, whatever, saying that there's going to be a Torah study for Nazarene, and then uh, invite the public if they want to come. And uh, when you're equipped well enough, you, you should go ahead and do it. And don't, don't expect that you can answer every question because... There's no way that everybody has all the information. Open it up to the mind of the group. If anybody has any knowledge on a subject, more than the person that's kind of the, uh, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm in charge of it, but I kind of allow Yahuwah to direct it. But, you know, he's the one that's in charge. But when we get together, uh, I usually have someone stop me in the middle of something and sometimes there's something off topic and I just simply uh, have to say well I don't know the answer or if I have an answer I'll give it but you know just do the best you can and let you who should do the leading okay but I would say I would highly encourage that if you had uh, three people or two people show up then that's great and you can just sit at the table at first and then as the as you get more people you might have a need for 10 chairs and, and then uh, maybe 15 chairs. And, you know, that reminds me, there was a, a sister who comes to a lot of our seminars. We didn't have any chairs. And she actually bought, she gave us money to go out and buy chairs. So we got these really nice little chairs, folding chairs that are comfortable, not really expensive. And uh, they were uh, something like, uh, I don't know, $20 a piece. I mean, for you know, if you buy anything less than that, it's going to be really junk. Yeah. But just start small, and uh, just a small group, and and, and if it, you know, you could even start out with, uh, you know, uh, just basically praying to Yahusha, asking him what it is that he wants us to learn about his will, because it's his will that matters, and and then let the group uh, wonder uh, about what the topic might want to be, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never know what these are going to be about either, you know. No. <laughs> I just, I, I wake up in the morning, come to the computer, and you're there, and I'm going, I have no idea what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah I just have to write down the questions, otherwise I'll just, I'll just get caught up in the moment. <laughs> and, uh, 
What were all those questions? <laughs> so, yeah. So you think we should, yeah, just uh, sure, just put something out and and do yeah, it. Yeah, just hit and the ground, you know, yeah. just start out and let Yahusha lead you. And if, uh, it's, if it's the first couple of weeks, it's just you and your missus. That's all right. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Because you'll be in the habit of uh, being prepared for that and having a guest. Oh, even having just one guest is really good. Uh, there's if somebody's even halfway interested in there, going, what What are you all about? You know, what would really be interesting is if uh, there was a like some of these Christian pastors would come and 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 sit in the audience and or you know at, or the group and come up and and have their say about why they disagree, which would be fun, because disagreement is okay, you know. There's no reason to get angry, because the only one that really, when, when I was very young in this, I used to feel anger in my heart towards people who disagree. And I realized that it's not really necessary for me to be there. It's not me they're really disagreeing with anyway. It's not that I have to be right. But the truth is the truth. And when the truth is being attacked, it's not you that's being attacked, so you don't have to take any of it. It's all deflected. And it's really Yahusha that they're angry at, you know, because he is the truth and he teaches the truth. So if they're angry at him, all you have to do is help guide them and help them get over this anger that's in them. Because a lot of the anger is reflected. And you don't have to reflect the anger. You can just reflect love and say, I understand that you're struggling with this. And I know that it's a conflict. And the reason you're conflicted is making you feel uh, unsettled. And, and it's like your foundations are slipping and you're frightened because you're going to have to change. And you know this because the truth is what it is. And uh, the truth doesn't change because it's a different date, you know. Yeah. A thousand years goes by, or four thousand years goes by. It doesn't change what's true, yeah. you know. Yeah. So just try to do the best you can and help them get through this, you know. And then uh, tell them that you love the commandments. I love the Torah, and why I love it is because of, not because of me. It's because Yahusha wrote it on my heart, and I have I have nothing that I can do about it. I love it, mm. and you know. I want to learn more, you know. <laughs> and that's why together is to learn more. Because the synagogues were houses of study. So your room or your, your building that you're in, that you're having your meeting, would be the synagogue, you know. I remember when I confronted a Christian pastor many years ago, and he has a, a, one of those mega places. You know, there's tens of thousands of people that attend. And I sat down and chatted with him for about an hour. And I was just asking him, why is it that what we do in the real world is nothing like what we see written down in the scriptures? And the scriptures is the same all the way through. And I, and I happened to mention that, that he has a very beautiful synagogue. And he got really angry because I used that word. I could see his rage. I mean, his face got red. We're not Jews. <laughs> Well, you know, and I, and, I, and I was just using a Greek word anyway. I mean, it was a, a word synagogue is Greek. But uh, I had this one fellow that uh, up in Indiana, which is a state north of us, and we went up to see him, and he was a Nazari, and he had a special room that he had placed in his little facility, and he said, you have to take your shoes off to go in this room. And I said, what's going on? It's a holy you know? place. <laughs> he said, that's what he said. He used that word, too. And I looked over in the corner. He had a Christmas tree over there. That's so what? He was, a, he was a messianic, not serene. Which? Kind of a, I'll do it at all. You know? Which? <laughs> and, uh, he, had this, uh, he had candles going on in this little dark room, too. Yeah. And I said, I don't think I want to go in there. Yeah. You know? And so in his heart, he's thinking, that's because he's got a demon. I don't, I don't think so. You know, yeah. but uh, actually, uh, we are the, the dwelling place. We're the dwelling place. Yeah. So we're a set-apart body. Our bodies are living stones 
that make up a temple ourselves. It's not a place. It's it's us ourselves. We are the third temple. Mm. Well, that was a very full episode, brother. <laughs> I, yeah, it always amazes me how it fills up. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, information that we can chat about. Yeah. But uh, you know, getting it together, I, I, it sounds like you're about to start having a seminar there. Yeah, it sounds like it. We're being encouraged to. I just wanted to run it by and see what you thought. Yeah. yeah. And uh, just go with the flow and, you know, don't take time away from your family too much because you've got five little ones. But, yeah. you know, Husha will be, you've got five years under your belt of this and all those years of the circus. So yeah. there's obviously something that you 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 have uh, of many, uh, I mean, I would think that you would be well equipped to be able to handle whatever comes your way. Yeah. But, you know, it would really be amazing if, if some of these pastors from the Christians would come in and sit with you, and if you invite them, you know, mm -hmm. maybe one or two, and then they can sit and dwell over these things with you. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the things that they're drawing on are Paul's letters that they've misunderstood yeah. and or the catechetical schools writers, you know, the headmasters like Augustine, mm -hmm. all those fellows, yeah. you know, yeah. so. <laughs> you know, of course, that's not scripture. But no. Yeah, that's what they're really living by, you know. Mm. Yeah. How do you explain yeah. that? How do you explain Halloween? You know, <laughs> that's something that's coming up. Do you all have Halloween there, too? Yeah, we do. It's it's become a bigger deal in recent years, but when I was a kid, it wasn't as big a deal. In America, it was a really big a deal, but in Australia, but it's becoming the same now. Well, yeah, America, the United, States, the United States has infected a lot of the planet with a lot of these strange customs because I guess uh, you know the, the faithful were were running away from the persecution you know from the Catholics mostly at first and then when the Protestants um, you know were being pursued the Puritans and and all the all the sects that were being attacked when they wound up here shortly thereafter, the uh, Irish had a famine, and the, when the famine, potato famine happened in the 1840s and 1850s, they brought these things over here, and they were actually laws on the books prohibiting things like Christmas and, and these Catholic uh, festivals that were actually against Torah. But, you know, now everybody's embracing it, you know. Mm. It's like Halloween is like bigger than, it's bigger than all of them. Really? Yeah. In fact, there's a new twist going on where they have zombie festivals. Oh. Yeah. Pretty soon, I guess, trolls and gnomes. You know. On Halloween? Or? No, they have zombie festivals uh, in our city uh, like months before the Halloween mm -hmm. thing. But of course, the zombie is going to be the biggest costume probably, too. Yeah. Most yeah. popular. Yeah. You it's know, funny. living... It's funny you talk about witchcraft because when we were Christians, you taught that uh, Halloween is just evil. Don't go near that. Just wait till Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is okay. Birthdays are okay. Bunny rabbits are okay. But not Halloween. Oh, really? Yeah, that, even, even in a lot of Christian denominations, Halloween is still fine. Really? It, and they even have little uh, alternative things when a few of their congregation starts to feel funny about it. So they say, well, we're not going to dress up like witches. We're going to dress up like uh, somebody else. And that makes it okay. Angels. <laughs> and we'll do it here at our, at our facility where we have our steeple. Yeah. And instead of out there in the neighborhood, we'll have candy and all those things and dunk for apples or whatever they do. And all these things are being uh, embraced by these denominations. And uh, they're giving them an alternative. You know, to Halloween. Just throw it in his face. When all they really have to do is keep the festivals of Yahuwah mm -hmm. instead. Mm -hmm. And then they, they won't have that problem, you know. Mm -hmm. And teach them the whole truth, you know. That these things are actually of the adversary. They're, they're things of darkness that you don't want to teach your children, mm -hmm. you know. But then all the uh, relatives will come in and say, Oh, you're depriving of all this fun and all this childhood happiness. <laughs> yeah. But 
don't you know there's a lake of fire? You know, yeah. put my children in there. Yeah. 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 Feel very we full. Had, yeah, we had a long one. <laughs> Look, we went an hour and a half. Hour and a half, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we've tried to keep it down to about 30 or 40 minutes. Yeah, it's not working, is it? <laughs> no. So, yeah, well, it was uh, great to be here with you today. Again. Yes, you too, brother. I'll yeah. see you next week. Yeah, and that'll be a couple of days before uh, Yom Kafar. Yeah, let me let me get my chart. Let's see. Okay. Here's today. That would be the fifth day of the week. One, two, three, four, five. That's yeah. today. And then... We have uh, Yom Kafar here a couple of days before Yom Kafar. Now that's what they call Yom Kippur. Yeah. <laughs> Not really the right pronunciation. But it's Yom Kafar, Day of Atonement or Day of Recovery. Yeah. And then the next week and then the next week. So we'll be talking on two more Sabbaths, you who are willing. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, rest okay. days. To realize we've gone a whole hour and a half. And you haven't even said anything about the beautiful pyramids behind you. What? Who put those there? <laughs> oh man! Yeah. So uh, beautiful. Yeah, some of those great, the great pyramids. Some say they were there before the flood. Oh. That's because they were already two thousand years old when. Uh, I'm going to mention that in my in my next seminar too. Yeah. Uh, when. Uh, you know, the seven wonders of the ancient world? Well, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the pyramids. And the other six wonders were, these things were 2,000 years older than the other ones. Uh, it's amazing. So, I mean, they just estimate it, you know. So you reckon when the water came down again, the, the pyramids were still there? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, some say that the people that were building those pyramids were huge people. They were giants, you know, because there's millions of stones, and each one of them weighs tons. And the engineers today still don't know how in the world. In fact, the, the Great Pyramid, as they call it, uh, is the largest human structure. Not tallest, but it, it was the tallest for most all of time until they started building really tall buildings. But it's still the largest human actual structure that's right. ever been built. You know, I mean, nothing comes close to it. So amazing. Yeah, I had no idea that I was sitting there and not noticing those guys. You know, it's a beautiful day out here, though. Yeah. 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 So you took me, you brought me back to Egypt. I brought yeah. you back to Egypt. <laughs> Are you sitting there too? Is it all around you too? Yeah, it's behind me We're too. We're both sitting oh. here together, mate. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you have some amazing things. I can't even tell you all the things that I'm, I'm impressed by, the things that you've done. It's I better, time to I say better, goodnight. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the wife, you better go to bed. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to bed. <laughs> well, happy Yom Teruah. You yes, know, a joyful too. Yom Teruah yep. to all of you. And let, out, let out one final blast, mate. Oh, why not? Sure. Let's why go. Not? Let me cover up my holes here. It's still right. Yom Teruah for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. See you all later. See you next bye week. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.